Um, today I'm going to be talking about Studio Ghibli in the natural world, so bear with me because I know that Rachel already um, I covered this topic on Monday. Um, but yeah, and please excuse any um, mispronunciations that I do um, because Japanese is not my forte. Um, just a little background for you, um, Studio Ghibli is a Japanese animation film studio. It's headed by the directors um, Takao Miyazaki and Isao Takahata. Um, the company's logo is a Totoro, right up in the corner, and you can see it on the back of his computer, which is a large nature spirit um, from the really um, popular My Neighbor Totoro. Um, notable films, uh, Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind, My Neighbor Totoro, Princess Mononoke, Howl's Moving, Moving Castle, Castle in the Sky, Pompoko, Kiki's Delivery Service, and probably most popular, Spirited Away. Um, and in this presentation, I'm going to be discussing the representations of the um, reestablishment or establishment of harmony between the natural and industrial worlds. And I'm going to be examining um, this theme in Princess Mononoke, Nausicaa, the Valley of the Wind, and Takahata's Pompoko. Um, so first of all, a little bit of background. Um, Princess Mononoke, you can see um, the quote up there. Uh, back then, man and beast lived in harmony, but as time went on, most of the great forests were destroyed. That's the one of the um, opening lines. So, um, the movie is actually a commentary. I saw it as a um, on deforestation and exploitation of minerals, um, and it follows Ashitaka as he searches for a cure to a deadly curse placed upon him when he slays a um, boar god who is turned into a demon. And the cause of this um, transformation is the tiny ball iron lodged inside the boar. So he, um, he's from the Yamishi people, who are known for their peaceful connection with the natural world. And this is a pre-industrial relationship that um, comes lost with the onset of civilization, or like industrialization, I suppose. Um, and it's set during the Iron Age, which I thought was when the Iron Age was dawning, which I thought was kind of interesting. Um, and it, that's around 1392 to 1573. Um, he traces the Iron Ball back to Iron Town, led by Lady Eboshi. And um, it's, the issue is complicated because Eboshi cares um, only for her own people and the town's well-being, even at the expense of the natural world. But um, she does have a lot of good qualities. She cares for um, kind of like the disenfranchised people um, of the world, including like prostitutes or former prostitutes and lepers. Um, but she doesn't really have much care about the surrounding natural world. So her quote, without, the, without that ancient god, the animals here would be nothing but dumb beasts once more. Um, so she kind of wants to have complete domination over the natural world. Um, so she sets out to kill the great nature spirit, who is a gentle giver and taker of life, um, and kind of embodies the spirit of nature, and she succeeds, uh, cutting off his head. And then as we, stand, as we saw in Rachel's presentation, um, it causes a lot of destru destruction, but it also um, revitalizes the land and destroys Iron Town. And in the end, Lady Eboshi um, expresses her desire to create a better Iron Town that will work with nature. So. That's where, um, that's the Morgoth Nago. Um, I wanted to find a scene for you because it was pretty cool and gross because you can see those demon worms. But um, his quote is, disgusting little creatures, soon all of you will feel my hate and suffer as I have suffered. So that kind of represents the hatred that kind of um, embodies nature, how nature feels towards humans. Um, in Nausicaa, here's a little quote, insects and humans cannot live in the same world, you know that. Um, that's King Jill to his daughter Na Nausicaa. Um, it's set in a post-apocalyptic era, um, a thousand years after the collapse of the industrialized world. And um, a fast-spreading toxic jungle is threatening the lives of rema the remaining humans. Um, and this uh, apocalypse, kind of, was uh, described as the holocaust that rapacious industrialization spawned. So pretty much humans were the cause of this. Um, but nature, by the surviving humans, is viewed as the enemy because it is kind of taking over and it's a threat to their lives. Um, Nausicaa is kind of exempt for that, from that view. She discovers that the toxic jungle is actually a purification system, um, which is trying to reverse the damage the industrial pollution, pollution caused all those years ago. Um, the ohms are the guardians of this genetically adapted jungle, and the soil is poisonous, it's not the jungle itself. So in the end, she preaches um, a peaceful approach to the throw of the toxic jungle and really stresses that humans and, na or humans and nature can coexist together um, if, uh, courtesy and respect is kind of given from both sides and kind of like an understanding is um, established between them. Um, and in the end, harmony is reached um, and Nausicaa populates the valley of the wind with purified toxic chemical plants. So this is a description of the, um, the fall itself, which I think is kind of 
eerily similar to our own current civilization. Um, in a few short centuries, industrialized civilization had spread across the surface of the planet, plundering the soil of its riches, fouling the air, and remolding life forms at will. This gargantuan industrial society had already peaked a thousand years after its foundation. Ahead lay abrupt and violent decline. The cities burned, welling up as clouds of poison in the war, um, remembered as the seven days of fire. The complex superstructure was lost almost was lost. Almost all the surface of the earth, earth of the earth was transformed into a sterile wasteland. So yeah, very um dystopian future. The next movie um is Pompoko by uh, the Unlike the last two who were by Miyazaki, this is by Takahata. Um, and then the quote up there, humans are sick, cruel, heartless beasts, and don't you forget it, which is um, something that one of the main characters, Shokuji's father, told him. Um, Pompoko, it follows a group of anthropomorphized raccoons who live in Tama Hills, and they're facing basically the destruction of their homeland due to urban sprawl. So um, overpopulation in Tokyo is kind of spilling over into the surrounding lands, and you're getting like massive, like, sub Suburb, suburbanization, um, I don't know what you would call that, um, which is kind of creating like the destruction and leveling of the forest. So a big theme here in, in the other movies as well, violence versus nonviolence, there's fighting within the raccoons as to how to handle the situations, and then there's obviously an outright war between the raccoons and humans. And this is, you know, the raccoons sometimes even kill the humans, and they express little to no remorse over the killings, um, but mostly they try to keep it kind of peaceful and just scaring off the humans um, through transforming themselves into like ghouls and goblins. Ghouls and goblins. Um, but none of their tactics work in the end. They can, the humans continue to spread and take over Tom Hills. Um, and they also uh, pollute neighboring forests. So it stretches, it, it's the impact of the um, urban sprawl kind of stretches past just Tom Hills. Um, the raccoons kind of in desperation eventually reveal themselves to the media and beg for their forest, but it's too late for Tom Hills. Though, the reveal on TV does um, make people kind of reevaluate their relationship to nature, and they express, um, they want to um, find ways for humans and raccoons to coexist in the future. Though, obviously for this group of raccoons, it's kind of too late. So, the remaining raccoons who can transform into different, um, you know, forms, decide to live amongst humans. Um, so they transform themselves into humans, and they go um, live, assimilate themselves into the culture, and actually Shokuji, um, at the end of the film, expresses his kind of admiration for the way um, humans can even put up with their toilsome kind of lives. So I thought that that was interesting. And there's the group of raccoons there. And um, the theme here is like overpopulation and urban sprawl, so the world is crawling with humans like roaches. Um, so, themes in both, all three of these movies, um, Harmony with Nature, Mizaki raises the problem of violence and its connection to the environment in a unique way that helps us to see that um, peacemaking must include the establishment of environmental conditions in which human beings can flourish. Indeed, he suggests that such conditions cannot be brought about through violence, harmony and care, not, um, not domination, uh, harmony and care, not domination make for peace. So, a theme here is, um, I think it's really important to note that Miyazaki um, and Takahata don't say that um, humans and nature should, or like humans should give nature everything back. They're, they obviously, um, the films obviously ex express that uh, a balance needs to be created, and humans do need to, like, if you want a sustainable future, you can't just say, well, we're going to push ourselves back to an era where we all had to, you know, go to the bathroom in the woods, because no human is going to buy into that. So it really stresses um, a relationship that's mutualistic wherein like both of the parties can kind of flourish and survive um, without losing like a lot of their current or like their previous lifestyles. Um, so a another big theme is that um, the characters, all the characters in this movie struggle between violence and nonviolence. Um, often violence and um, domination seem like the only course. Um, and a lot of this comes up about, I thought, because of a shift in power dynamics, you see that uh, these movies are placed in, er in eras where nature had cr previously kind of ruled and had the power, and then humans, due to industrialization or urban sprawl or just growing population numbers, kind of like you see this um, increase in their power that uh, displaces nature, which creates a lot of tension between the two groups and a struggle for power. Um, 
each side kind of struggles for total domination, even nature. So it's kind of like um, <coughs> go go big or go home. Um, they they don't want um, part of their force back. They want all of their force back from Iron Town. Um, they're work they're averse to working together whatsoever for the advancement of both societies, at least at first. Um, so you can see here Ashitaka versus Mononoke, Lady Yoboshi, Gaza of the Forest, that was rife with tension and violence. Um, Nausicaa versus Kushana and probably the Pejites and um, other surviving human civilizations. And then the Town of Hills Raccoons versus humans. Um, but in the end, it's peace, understanding, and courtesy, not violence, that ultimately establishes balance between the two worlds. And this balance is Miyazaki and Takahata's dress attainable. Um, the main characters in this um, films kind of facilitate the establishment of harmony between the two worlds, um, and I think this is made mostly because of their unique positions um, that they occupy within their cultures. Um, Nausicaa, quote, understands that she and her people must work with nature, not strive against it if there is to be harmony. This rejection of anthropocentrism allows her to see that nature deserves the courteous respect of human beings, end quote. So as a princess, she obviously concerns herself with the survival of her own people as well. Um, even though she does have a very vested interest in the survival of the forest. So she, she kind of has to see things from both sides. Um, Ashitaka is kind of similar. He's torn um, between the care for the people of Iron Town, who he comes to really like, and the desire to preserve nature. Quote, Ashitaka occupies a position in between culture, the people and occupations of Iron Town, and nature in the forest, end quote. So because he's in love with San, Princess Mononoke, and because he comes from the Amishi people, which, um, as I said before, they're kind of like pre-industrial um, culture. Uh, he does really understand the two uh, warring factions, and he doesn't want there to be destruction on either side. Um, the raccoons of Tama Hills are probably the most one-sided because 